Hi, I'm Micha Mazzini, and I will read you a short story, I'm the One, that was published in 2012. I know how busy you are. I decided to make a recording and send you a link. It will be easier for me to speak as I seem to have had more and more inner conversations with you over the last year. Probably more than we ever talked in reality. You can listen to this in installments. Uh, your mother died alone. I was going to erase that, as there is no other way of dying, but I had always thought there was a special bond between us. 30 years is a long time, and you are probably imagine this is a straight line, but living together is not like that. There are twists, oscillations, barriers, but jumps. Perhaps no life is a straight line, even if I look at my own or you at yours. You are still younger than our marriage was. You were quick even at birth. You simply fell into the doctor's hands. And just as at the age of two, you rejected the porridge I made for you with a single very final no, you rejected everything we... Okay, don't get me wrong. I don't want to reproach you. That's just what you are like. It was the right thing to do, going to America. And I'm proud that you have your own successful company. I can imagine how boring our life must have seemed to you here in Slovenia when you were still in school. You went to Germany in grade three to do your international exams on your own. I was worried, but at the same time, I admired you. I digress again. Back to our mother, back to your mother. She went to the doctors and came back separated from me and enveloped in an invisible cocoon. There was no change in what she said. If we were corresponding like you and me, I wouldn't have noticed anything. But she pushed me away somehow as if she'd moved to another apartment. I left her alone for a couple of days before I started asking questions. No, 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 everything was all right, she said. I went to see the doctor. We both had the same one, and I didn't know what to say, but then she asked, how is your wife taking it? I replied with something quick. Your mother went for chemotherapy once a month. Her hair fell out, she was sick. And all the things you see in the movies and read about in magazines, but with the addition of the smells and sensations, how cold her skin felt in those brief moments before she withdrew from me. She never mentioned her illness and I act to the very end as if nothing was happening. She moved to your room and locked herself in. I admit I eavesdropped and then fled to the bathroom whenever she cried. At other times, there was a sort of mumbling, and I didn't know what it could be. When a taxi came to take her for a chemotherapy, I dug out the spare key from the basement and went into the room. Pictures of Jesus and Mary, Rose. You flew in for the funeral. You know everything about that. But later, I had to clear her things by myself. I threw it all in the dumpster or gave it to charity. The only things I didn't know what to do with were the religious pictures. In the end, I turned them to face the wall in your room. I wished I could have a job at least partly like yours. According to what you write and I imagine, it involves meeting after meeting, decision after decision from morning till night. You know that in Slovenia, the head of a division in a big state-owned company has much too much time to think during working hours. And that I'm not so high on the hierarchical ladder as to sit behind the door. You cannot see through, but I'm just an important enough position for my monitor to be turned away from those passing by. I will never forget how you came to visit me when you were still in elementary school and ask me with astonishment. And you sit here for eight hours, just sitting. I home, my photographed an Italian language girl's book and transferred the photographs to the computer at work. And every time I learned an irregular verb, 
I nodded in satisfaction so that my subordinates could see that I was doing so. I know how much you detested our way of doing things and how much you wanted to go to the United States. Did it fulfill your hopes? I don't want to defend myself, but I would like to remind you of the afternoon when you came home from your first day at your first job when you were a student, totally in shock. The other employees set, set you in a chair and told you not to do any work because that would raise their norm. If everyone cooperated and the norm was set low enough, people were able to go home rested and be ready to do some real work for themselves in the afternoon. Anyway, what I was going to say, I, I wanted to go uh, to the Monday morning meetings, but suffered every time as I watched my boss making the wrong decisions. He had been in that position for four years, but it would have been more useful for the company if he had spent the time learning to play the mouse organ. The heads of divisions left the meetings exhausted and went directly to the canteen for coffee, spending a long time blowing ripples over the top before finishing with small sips. The predominant opinion was that behind your boss's hopelessness lay a cunning plan. The chief executive wanted to privatize the company and so had appointed idiots in the directorial positions who would ruin everything and pave the way for a cheap buyout. And then one afternoon I bumped into the chief executive himself in the corridor. He was alone. Without his usual entourage of secretaries, assistants, and assorted brown noses. How are you? he asked me. In a haste as we shook hands, he was already looking at the elevator doors. If your mother had been alive and you still dependent on me, I would have kept quiet. In the past, every moment at work, I was aware of having to support you too. Don't get me wrong, I'm not reproaching, I'm, I'm not. Okay. At first, he looked at me in surprise as I talked and talked. Then he began listening in astonishment, shaking his head. No, 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 there was no plan. He was not going to buy the company. He almost ran to the elevator, shouting over his shoulder that his secretary would give me an appointment. I went to the office and learned the word pacordiary. I have never held much personal stuff there, so I wasn't afraid of packing. The chief executive's personal assistant called me and gave me an appointment. I wondered if I should get a new suit, but then decided to wear the one I bought for your mother's funeral. The chief executive gave me a whole hour of his time, and with the exception of the greeting, spent the entire time apologizing. Not specifically, but in a roundabout, fuzzy manner, the way politicians do. Every word clear, but combined into a long series of puffs, as if emitted by the exhaust pipe of an old car running on honey. The gist of it was that the politicians dictated who he employed, and then he had to carefully ensure that members of all the key political parties were equally represented. That's why he, he got who he got. And anyway, he had never been interested in the field our company was involved in. He had done something entirely different at the university, and so on. At home, I sat in the kitchen holding a cup of tea in my hands until it went cold. Can you still remember how dull November is in Ljubljana? All that went through my head was, there is no plan. The chief executive was where he was because they could not be put somewhere else. Other directors were there because they knew the right people. They were appointed to position of ineptitude by their connections and I by my obedience. When I saw about an expert I've been, oh no, enough. I don't want to go on about it. What I'd like to tell you is that I abandoned my Italian and thought about the horrible void that gaps before me. I didn't just sleep on it, but spent the whole week obsessing about it, increasingly numbed by the horror of, of our fate being in the hands of people who were totally inept. No big plan. No great mind behind it all. Not even a secret organization. Nothing. Our bosses were idiots playing their small, insignificant games, tripping over and over 
one another while trying to climb higher. We were at a court of intrigue, but the king was not only invisible, he wasn't there at all. I spent the weekend sitting on a kitchen chair, brewing gallons of tea. After a few pots of Ceylon, my heart began palpitating, so I switched to Herba. All I could see through the window was fog swirling in thick, sticky threads. I decided to sell the apartment and move to a smaller one. To leave my job and... Okay, okay. On Sunday, I changed my mind and copied the German language girl with my camera. As you know, it then took nearly six months before I really sold the apartment. The last things I removed were the religious pictures. I swallowed hard and focused on my hand before opening the door to your room. It was stuffy and dusty and the wind occasionally swept the window with fallen cherry tree petals. I waited, followed one petal all the way to the window, watched it swirling there until it helplessly succumbed and the wind carried it away. I didn't know, and to this day, I haven't recognized the burden that was waiting on me. In my left hand, I was holding an open biodegradable bag, gathering strength. My hand paused just before reaching the pictures, but the memories didn't come until I turned the images around and saw the pure lily colors. It was worth it, is all I can say. If my life seems boring to you with her, and it was worth it. I stood in the middle of the kitchen holding the bag. The picture frames knocked against each other gently whenever my arm shook. She had never been a believer, never mentioned God, but after she got ill, she exchanged me for him. She addressed all her requests and questions to him, who has a carefully woven plan for us all. Then she died and I believed in him no more than I had before. I chose my oldest suit, wrapped the back in it, and took it to the Christian charity collection point. The next year, nothing changed at work. Things kept going downhill. Whenever I, I met friends from university or acquaintances in my field, they all moaned about how badly they were doing, but in the end winked, implying that those up there had a plan. The world economic crisis began, and companies fell like dominoes. No one bought them out, and all the employees who'd been laid off went out on the streets with empty card boxes. I read Faustus in German, translating word by word, then Dante in Italian, and in the meantime followed the news on the internet. Where all the debates revolved around in conspiracy theories, the plans of secret networks, and the great mind behind it all, there was smell of war in the air. One lunchtime, a young employee took the seat opposite me in the canteen and we began chatting. After the cursory polite in introductions, he steered the conversation in the direction of secret plans. And I don't know what was up with him, but he paused in mid-sentence and looked at me for a long time. Then he said, this is going to sound strange, but the other day, as I listened to the boss, it struck me, what if he's just stupid and incapable? And not just him, but all of them. What if there is no plan behind it all and this is just a ship of fools? I kept shaking my head, comforting him. He could no longer see me focused on his thoughts staring in the space. My girlfriend tells me we should take a loan for a house, but, but how can I help children in a world like this? I'm the one, I said. He choked out a few more sentences before stopping and looking at me with surprise. Which one? The one behind it all was a plan. But, but you're just ahead of, true, but on purpose. You know yourself, those at the top come and go. They're always in the public eye. It's safer lower down. You mustn't tell anyone, no? I won't, he promised fervently. So there is a plan for this company, yes. I don't know about the rest. It's outside my jurisdiction. I see, he said, nodding and winking. I returned the wink. And that was that. Of course, he did tell others. I noticed that the atmosphere in the company slowly improved. People became less dejected and despondent. 
they protested less when the layoffs came. They knew that they were part of the plan. The older ones were, went first, except me. No one ever talks to me. Sometimes they come with a request concerning themselves or relative, but I just shake my head helplessly as if I don't know what they are talking about. They resent it, but not so much as you would expect. They know there's a plan behind it all, which is beyond their understanding, and that in this company, I'm its caretaker and implementer. Ever since that talk in the canteen, I've been meaning to tell you about this, but I didn't want to bother you. On the other hand, it seems I've started something that should be spread wider. You have always been like a cork out of the champagne bottle when you tackle something. As I watched the American invasion on, of Iraq on television, the collapse of the system, the plunderings of the museum, I had the same feelings I had on those Monday morning meetings. They must have a plan, they must. It transpired they did not. Whenever I see some crisis in the news, I remember this feeling in you. The world needs some, someone who will take the responsibility onto themselves. You would know how to do it. You organize a network of older people, gray-haired, fatherly, or motherly, who in the moment of general despair quietly ask their colleagues not to tell anyone about them being the one. The one. People cannot get by without a plan, without purpose. Jesus tried to say the world with love, and after two millennia, we can't safely say things have not worked out for the best. It's time to salvage the situation by taking resp responsibility. That's all I wanted to tell you. You don't have to answer, just think about it. I must finish while the light is still good and I can photograph the Japanese language girl.